couple of weeks ago, Star columnist Vahe Gregorian and I started talking about a panel discussion around the subject of race in sports and wondered if we could find some Kansas City area sports leaders interested in joining us. Calls went out to a half dozen people. Six was the limit because of issues with technology and timing, and all six quickly responded with their interest. It's Friday, June 26th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. On today's Sports BKC, Vahe and I spend a few minutes discussing how we put together the program, and then we'll play the entire audio, which lasts about 45 minutes. If you want to catch the video version, it's available on the Star's Facebook and YouTube channels. The panelists will be introduced about a minute into the program. Hope you enjoy. All right, Vahe, let's talk about this. Um, uh, We just did a uh, panel discussion with a group of coaches and athletes and administrators that um, uh, that, that came together and helped us out on, on on a project that I, I think we've been saying that it's been our idea, but it really was your idea, and you dragged me into it and uh, willingly. And then we had discussions about it and um, who to get and how it might come off. And I just thought the panelists were terrific. The the messaging was fantastic. And why don't you take us back to uh, how we got started on this and what was the inspiration for it? You know, Blair, it, it strikes me, I think we just got talking about it somehow. And I think right as this erupted in the in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, I think both of us felt like there there is uh, a seismic thing going on here that, that we need to find new ways to speak to if we can. And I think we also are really cognizant of these um, remarkable forces in our community. And at that point, I don't think, I think Christiana Carr was maybe just getting ready to take some of her initiatives. We didn't know too much about her yet then, but but we have spent over the years enough time with Conzo Martin, Bill Self, Bob Kendrick, Dayton Moore, and- uh, And then gotten to and, know Tyron Matthews. And gotten to know Tyron just in this last, last year as all men of, of really great intelligence, uh, I think uh, thoughtful about others, conscious of race issues for one reason or another. We've seen uh, them in so many different settings. Um, we were talking about this the other day, you know, seen Dayton comforting Giordano Ventura's family in the Dominican and in prisons. And, you know, you've been any number of places with, with Bill and, and seeing him deal with people. So I think, you know, without rambling too much more, I just think we, we thought that they would be thought-provoking people to have on here. And as we kept kicking it around, I think you used this term in your intro of them that, you know, we had a dream dream list, sort of unique to our, our market, our audience, and, oh, the, the whole dream list came through. It did. And it, it happened quickly, too. As the calls went out, I I remember us talking about the candidates for this panel discussion. And first of all, I should say, we were limited to five or six people just because right. for technological reasons, right. and just filling the screen, and then also the, the time constraint we were on. We You could have invited two, three, four more people yeah. and, and gotten some great... And would like to have. And, and right? love yeah. to have. We just, yeah. we just couldn't do it. But So we came up with this original list. You've, you've mentioned the names, and I was just... You started making calls, and by the end of the day... You, Dayton Moore had agreed to do it, and Bob Kendrick had agreed. Conzo had agreed to do it. Yeah, I mean it was. It, it was like it was like the, rapid it was like, fire. Yeah, they bounced back to you. I mean, they, 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 they requested. Did. And in fact, I, I I hope I'm not uh, violating any trust of Dayton's by saying this, but I I texted Dayton, and I think he texted. I just sort of laid it out generically. I think he texted back within a minute and just said, "I'm in!" Exclamation point, which I think said a lot about the current situation too. I think. There have been times, certainly um, when you know everything was going on with Colin Kaepernick, where we we would see people uh, walk quite gingerly about any of these topics. And frankly, maybe we tiptoed into the question asking of, of, of others, right? I mean, I think sure. I think there was some kind of little, I don't know, little gauze over the whole thing, right? It's just something kind of preventing full full unfiltered talk. And I, I, I bring that up to say, I, I think anybody that hears this will really be struck by how, how from the heart and uh, candid 
I think people were. And I think that, that was the, one of the topics that came up again and again about just sort of opening it up. And I, you were very struck by Conzo. I really was. Conzo, maybe as much as anybody, Christiana as yeah. well. You all, yeah. you're going to hear all of this, and uh, when when Vahe and I stop talking, you will hear <laughs> uh, the, the panelists. But I thought it was interesting to let you know how it came together. The one thing that I, I remember thinking at the time is we we came up with this idea about two weeks ago, and I was thinking, and and, and you know, it just takes time to 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 get it together, right? To get uh, everybody on the same page and to plan it and to get the date right and the time, all that. And I was thinking, boy, you know, the the, week, the days are, are are passing by, and will the will the topic be pertinent by the time we finally get this thing going? Man, the news just never stops with um, you know with, with the social injustice, and, yeah, and race, and just just this week, uh, statues coming down, and and I and I think you know there's 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 something uh, very encouraging about that point, which is just that. I don't know if you agree with this, but I, I certainly feel like in my lifetime, sort of the windows are rolled down on this more than more than ever, right? Like people, I feel like people aren't just paying lip service the way, you know, people are inclined to do. And I feel like people are listening. People want to hear. And I think that's um, ratcheted up in all of us. And, and, and I think that's why it's still so germane. It's funny, I do remember thinking, Blair, I was taking that I put off a week off for some weeks, and I just thought I'd mark that week to take off when this happened. And I started feeling a little bad about that, but I also thought I better basically stick with it, and I'm pretty sure racism is still going to be around. The topic's <laughs> going to still be pertinent. I don't think I understood that it would um, have this kind of foundation for this long, and I think it, it suggests that it's it's going to be front and center for a long time. I agree. As it should be. Absolutely. Well, I thought every panelist contributed something unique. Their perspective was uh, was appreciated and welcome and different. And, um, and I, you know, here I am trying to moderate it, but I was, I was kind of, you know, enraptured by what they were saying and wanted to, uh, and wanted to pay, you know, just pay close attention to everything that they were saying and, and then try to transition into the next, uh, into the next, uh, Panelist, but anyway, without further ado, we're gonna uh, uh, we're gonna play it for you after a break, and we hope you enjoy it. it lasts about about forty four minutes. Thanks, Vahe. Thanks, Blair. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners: unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars' award winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Welcome to the Kansas City Star Forum on Race and Sports. I'm star sports writer Blair Kirkhoff. When friend and colleague Vahe Gregorian and I batted around the idea of a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago, we exchanged names for panelists and came up with a wish list. Our wish came true. We asked six people who are prominent and impactful on the Kansas City sports scene to participate, and we received six yeses. We took that as a strong indication of the importance of the issue and where we are as a society exactly one month after the killing of George Floyd by a Minneapolis white police officer. So much has happened since then. Protests, police reforms, the removal of symbols like statues of those with racism in their backgrounds. And although little has happened in the way of sports action because of the COVID-19 pandemic, sports have very much been part of the news over the past month. We're here to talk about that and the role sports has played and can play in our progress. Let me introduce the panel. Christiana Carr is a junior basketball player at Kansas State. She's a two-year starter and was an all-Big 12 freshman selection in 2019. She's our youngest panelist 
and has been incredibly active over the past month. We'll talk about that in a moment. Welcome, Christiana. Hello. Tyron Matthew was voted the Chiefs' most valuable player in his first year on the team. All he did from his safety position and everywhere else he roamed on the defense was help Kansas City win its super, first Super Bowl in 50 years. Thanks for joining us, Tyron. Thanks for having me, Blair. Dayton Moore is the Royal Senior Vice President for Baseball Operations and General Manager, and he's especially a happy and busy man today. Baseball is back with spring training 2.0 set to begin next week. Welcome, Dayton. Thanks, Blair. Great to be with you. Conzo Martin's teams go to the NCAA tournament wherever he coaches. He's won nearly 60% of his games in a dozen years and had Missouri playing its best basketball when the season came to an abrupt end. Welcome, Conzo. Hey, Thank Bill, you for having me. There you go. Welcome, Conzo. Hey, Bill Self entered the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2017. He'll begin his 18th season as the Kansas coach next year. His teams have won 15 Big 12 championships. Hey, Bill. Hey, guys. And since 2011, Bob Kendrick has been president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum located at Kansas City's historic 18th and Vine District. He was gracious enough to invite us to hold this event in the building at the Field of Legends. There would have been no better place to have this discussion, but the pandemic forced our hand. Hi, Bob, and keep us in mind for next time. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's an honor to be part of this distinguished group of people. <laughs> Very good. Okay, we're going to start with a question for the group that I'd, I'd like everyone to take a swing at, um, and, and it's this. As we've seen or even participated in protests and absorbed all the news over the past month, I'm wondering how the events have stirred your emotions or inspired you or even awakened you. And I'd like to ask each of you to answer. We'll start with Christiana. You went to Topeka five days after George Floyd's death to protest. I want you to tell us about that and the other events you attended over the next few weeks. Over the next few weeks what compelled you to do that? You know, honestly, being from in Minneapolis area, um, when I saw the, the video first hit the news and everyone was kind of protesting and going through all of the violence acts and the looting and the rioting, I wanted to do something, but I knew that it was too dangerous for me to go back home at the time. So when I saw on Facebook that there was a protest in Topeka, I immediately made the decision that I was going to go. I made some posters with my friends and we ended up going and it was a great protest. And it was great to be a part of something that was peaceful. After all you see on the news is violence and just negative comments about everything that's been going on. Um, and then over the past couple of weeks, I went back home to Minnesota and protested um, with the 10 K foundation and then helped uh, with donations in North Minneapolis as well. And so it was good to be able to be back home and, and help out with my friends and family and kind of get things back on the swing of things and moving the needle forward. You were actually um, familiar with the, the store uh, where George Floyd, uh, the, the area in front of the store where George Floyd was killed. You know that part of town. Yes, I do. Uh, my friend lives right around the corner from it. Um, we would go there and get food. I mean, there's only one cup foods in the area. So it's, it's kind of <laughs> easy to spot out. Once I saw it on video, I immediately knew where that was uh, being a Minneapolis native. So. Let me ask you this too, Christiana. I, I saw or uh, read a story where um, you, you received tons of positive feedback for what you did, but but not all of it was positive. There were some there were some death threats even. And to tell us about that. Yeah, I, I tweeted out um, about you know if you don't support me with supporting Black Lives Matter, then I feel like you shouldn't support me with my sport as well. And I mean, when my mom first told me about it, I was kind of iffy about tweeting it, just about the backlash and everything, and. At first, I got a lot of positive comments about people supporting me, and a talk show host quoted my tweet and kind of made a joke about the WNBA and how nobody watches it. And immediately after that, I had tweets about people saying that I should burn in the city of Minneapolis. I, um, they don't support me in either. They don't know what women's basketball is. And so, I mean, as much hate comments as I've gotten, I've definitely gotten a lot of support with that as well. So. I mean, it shows just how much people that I don't even know that still support me, and, and that means a lot as well. So. Very good. Hey, Kanjo, I'm going I'm to go as, the, as you appear on my screen. So, Kanjo, I'm just wondering what the, what, what the last month has meant to you, and, and uh, I, I know that uh, 
uh, having spoken to you about it, there have been some, uh, you know, a, a march on your campus that you participated in and just generally tell us what it's meant to you over the last month. Well, it, obviously it was a tough one to see the, the George Floyd video and, and to be totally honest, it was the first video I watched in this entirety because I, I've seen those for years and uh, I, I just, my stomach just can't take that. I'm not sure ever since I've had kids, I just can't, I can't watch those videos, but I watched it through and it, it was, it was really tough to watch. And, um, you know, for me, uh, I, I have to be totally honest here. When I was at Cal Berkeley, uh, I, I, I saw Colin Kaepernick up close when I, when I saw when he took the knee because the camp was probably 45 minutes from the San Francisco 49ers facilities. And, you know, you, you want to do something, you want to step out, you want to say something, but, you know, truthfully, self-preservation takes over because you have to provide for your family, you work for a university, so you want to be careful in how you speak. And that was, that was tough for me. So whatever came around again, I was just telling myself and I was constantly praying to God, I, I have to get out in front of this some way, shape or form, because I, I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois, so I've, I've seen a lot of it up close and witnessed it from afar. So in this time around, I, I think the thing that helped me with the COVID virus, which is an unfortunate pandemic and has caused a lot of deaths and anxiety and stress, loss of jobs. But I think what it allowed all of us to do time stop so we can all see it. So there's not a sporting event the next day to go to. And I think that really helped me to get out in front of this thing because, you know, everybody was asking, how, how should you respond? Should you tweet this social media? And it, it took me about a week, just I didn't know what to say because you want to be respectful to all, but you understand the situation and the task at hand. So. I just said from this point on, this is who I am, and it has to be a part of my life, and I, and I have to get out in front of this. And um, and this, I, I I said to my sons respectfully. I just said this about a week or so to my two sons. One's 22, one's 18, and I just said, guys, I I don't know if I'll be on this earth uh, to see uh, uh, total equality, but 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 I pray that my grandkids, if God willing, that they can they can have a peaceful life. But I said, I, and I I just say like there was threats. I'm not worried about threats, but I just. I just felt like I'm not sure I'll be able to see that because when you're talking percentage and you study history and, and the black communities uh, and, and the communities of colors, that's probably a 70 year wealth gap. And there's a lot of catching up to do. So and I just told my sons, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure uh, my grandkids can live a peaceful life. Very good. Hey, Tyron, I know that um, sp speaking of the, the Colin Kaepernick uh, situation of three or four years ago, that you may have had a similar reaction, and and there was there just seemed to be a split, not a split, but a, a a stronger disagreement among players in the NFL about it. That doesn't seem to be the case now. After the video that you and other NFL stars uh, put together, including Patrick Mahomes, um, what Roger Goodell was uh, came out with an apology in the next day or so. Um, tell us um, how about how about some of your thoughts on on the past month and. Uh, and how your feelings about Kaepernick evolved. Yeah, I think for, for me, um, you know, seeing the death of George Floyd, um, you know, you know we, we've been able to see so many videos, you know, since social media and, you know, we've become traumatized. You know, a lot of us have become numb in some cases. Um, and I think for me, it's just, you know, you get tired of seeing the same old thing, um, especially to your people. Um, I think that's first and foremost, um, you know, um, I, I think something needs to be done, um, you know, towards police reform, um, towards, you know, educating um, minorities um, on the laws, uh, you know, on police reform, different things like that. And um, and I feel like we have a long way to go. Um, and uh, I feel like we're going to be stronger together. Um, you know, and I, I think this opportunity, um, or, or really these last few months have given us the opportunity to, to come closer, right, to, to have conversations and um, to be honest, to be open, and to to to, to ultimately be real with each other, uh, and, and uh, be sensitive as well. And um, you know, even speaking from an NFL player's perspective, you know, um, you know, I think in hindsight we feel like we let Kyle and Kaepernick down. Um, you know, um, for a lot of us, we were focusing on self, and we were focusing on our careers, and um, not necessarily understanding the, the the true impact. You know, we could really make on you know really bringing about uh social change um i feel like we have a, a, one of the biggest platforms in the world um we can reach a lot of people we can inspire a lot of people i thought the i thought the black lives matter video that we did i thought um initially um uh, it, it, it did something for us as players right um to, to, to see guys like roger goodell 
step up and, and say that he was wrong and say that he may have made a mistake, you know, um, in his decision making. To see different owners step up, to see coaches lead the way, um, to give their players the floor to, to, to express, you know, how they're feeling. You know, um, I think so much of what we do in sports is psychological. And um, if all of us could kind of get into each other's mind um, for the better, um, I think it can only, you know, bring great change. And I think sports um, could, could absolutely do that for the world. We don't need to wait on any other entity to, to do, um, you know, what we can do. Um, I think if you look at sports or you look at teams, um, a lot of those people don't come in there thinking about religion. They don't come in there thinking about the color of their skin. It's the common goal, right? Um, it's something that we all want to reach. And, um, you know, teams, sports, we have the ability to show the world um, you know, what we do on a daily basis, you know, put a lot of things to the side, work well with each other, begin to love each other, begin to grow with each other. I got guys that come from the other side of the earth, <laughs> me and still those guys friends to this day. We come from different backgrounds, but yet sports have, you know, it, it brought us to a common ground. And, and I just pray every, each and every night that the world can really see, you know, you know who we are uh, on a daily basis and be inspired by that. Very good. Hey, Dayton, I know that you have, um, you have gotten uh, or attempted to talk with, with, with a lot of people, gotten in people's minds uh, about what, uh, uh, what they're about. And I was, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the prisons that you have visited over, over the years. And, um, you know, we, we, know, we know all about, and, and, we'll, and we'll talk to Bob also about this, the Urban Youth Academy, at the Negro Leagues Museum, behind the Negro Leagues Museum. But I was really curious about your experiences visiting prisons, um, seeing people of all colors and all backgrounds. But uh, what, uh, what, did, what did you glean from that? And how, how has that helped you form your viewpoints? Well, Blair, let me just say it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to be uh, in this setting with, with this group of people. And because we all have a, a great heart for the next generation. This is what this is all about. And um, you know, we, we definitely have to do better. And I think we've always known that there's injustices in the world. We've seen the injustices in the world. But I think for the first time, and to, to Conzo's point, maybe it was COVID-19 that made us stop and reflect. But I think for the first time, our hearts felt the injustices. And, and that's why I'm, I'm so positive and optimistic about change. But, you know, I was asked this question quite a bit about, uh, some of the protests and some of the rioting and the destruction of property and some of the violence that was taking place. And there's nobody with a sane mind that condones violence and destruction of property. We hurt for those individuals. But when you spend time um, in the prisons with uh, men from all walks of life that have been incarcerated and you hear their stories and you listen to their journey and you try to feel their hearts, you can understand why things lead uh, to destruction and why things sometimes become violent. And so what, what we've learned from that is the importance of, of understanding and listening to, to other stories. And so we're not, very, we're, we're not very good as human beings to articulate emotion and feelings. We're, we're, we're oftentimes not very good about that. And, and so sometimes words get in the way of understanding each other's hearts. And so I think that's where it begins and ends in trying to understand uh, what others have been through and, and what they've experienced in life. So that's, that's some of the things that our prison uh, visits and ministry is, has, taught, has taught us. Hey, Bill, how about the last month? What, um, what, what's, what's it been about for you and your observations and, and, um, and just how has it talked to you? Well, I think that uh, obviously it affected everybody that witnessed what occurred in Minneapolis in, in a way that, that, that uh, brought along anger, sadness, uh, so many different emotions because we witnessed a murder right there before our eyes. The thing that I, that I, I have probably learned more in this month uh, as far as trying to educate myself and research and studying thinking as a basketball coach and being in the most diverse groups that maybe I had a pretty good handle on things. And I realize now I really didn't have near as good a handle on it as what I thought I did. 
uh, in so many ways. Uh, uh, me personally, I've spent quite a bit of time listening to podcasts, watching documentaries, watching certain movies, uh, 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 and, and putting myself in a position to, to see totally uh, the perspective that others come from just as others should see the perspective that, that, that others different than them come from. And, and it's been educational. My players have been great. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Conzo's done the same thing, talked to his players. And, 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 and this was a time I think that as a coach and a leader, that it's time for me to maybe, uh, 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 although we've been vocal uh, uh, to a pretty strong extent, but maybe, uh, allow my players and encourage my players to have the voice and, and have me stand with them as opposed to standing in front of them and having them always stand behind me. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to our players getting back. I'm looking forward to works becoming actions. I'm looking forward to doing different things in our university, in our, in our, in our community uh, uh, that can make this a much better place. And, and uh, you know, I, I do think the words have been great. And COVID has probably tempered uh, uh, some action just because of the ability to be together and do things as a group. But I'm looking forward to uh, us putting some words into action. And I, th I do think we have a platform to what Tyron said, to, to really make a difference, even if not on a national or world scale like many can. But we can certainly make a difference in our own communities, in our own state. That's right. Um, um how about uh, how about you? I, you know, you you're the president of a place that um, everybody who goes there just falls in love with it if they're not familiar with it, and uh, and you tell a story that's so unique, and you tell it so well. Um, and and I, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to ask you how the how the events of the past month have have in, in, impacted you. Well, just like all the other guests, you you your emotions span the gamut. You know, when you watch that video, if you don't feel that, you have no soul. And, and so you go through, I think, an array of emotions that went from disbelief to outrage to sadness. And then you move into a realm of hope and determination. And for me, it stems from seeing young folks who are likely engaged in this kind of effort, really to this degree, Blair, for the first time ever. And I relate a story, my young kid that works for us who goes to Chicago, University of Chicago, was part of the plaza protest. And uh, the situations occurred where the police had to use tear gas, I felt they had to use tear gas. And, and I told her grandfather, who's a golf buddy of mine, I said, you know what? 20 years from now, that tear gas episode is going to be a badge of honor because she stood up for something that she believed in. And so when I see Christiana and I see Tyran and I see so many other young people who are engaged, that's what gives me that optimism that this time there is this possibility for us to actually impact and make the needed change that has to occur. It was so painful and so vile and so vivid in front of so many who maybe they're not impacted, even though they may believe these things are happening. Sometimes I think folks didn't believe that this stuff was happening. For us as African-Americans, it wasn't new. It, it, it wasn't new, but it was that, that kind of vividness and vileness. It, it, it just stirred so many emotions and so many people and for me, and I, I would imagine the same thing for, for Quanzo and for Tyran, if you grew up, and I grew up in the South, and, and so, you know, you, your parents had that conversation with us. And so the whole nature of this mindset of the police to protect and serve has never really been applicable in the African-American community. You know, it was always this level of distrust and fearfulness for the very things that we witnessed when it shouldn't be, you know. Uh, it should be indeed protect and serve. But you are prepared as a kid growing up in the South of everything that you needed to do, or as by, I call them now, survival skills. Uh, but again, I think we have this wonderful opportunity 
to see change occur because we've got so many who are now stepping to the front line of this issue, addressing it for what it is, a real issue in this country. And it's not easy to talk about. You know, and it's not supposed to be easy. And, and, and we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, and that's the way we have to look at it. And, and, and that's why I, here at the museum, you know, that's why I say there's no better place to have this conversation than the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, which is all of, is a story of social justice. And it's a story of civil rights, as you well know, as seen through the lens of baseball. Kajo, I'm, I'm curious, you have, um, uh, you have just recently in the last few weeks had the, the Columbia chief of police uh, over to, to speak to your team. And um, I'm wondering what you, what you were hoping to get from that and what was the, the reaction from your team to, to that exercise? Well, it was, it was probably five days after uh, George oh, wow. Floyd. And, uh, and, and again, we, we do this all the time, not necessarily police officers every week. So I don't, I don't want to uh, create that type of picture or that atmosphere. But we had the chief, uh, I met with him. I just said, I think it'd be very important that you come on with our guys. He was excited to do it. Um, and when he came on, so I, I didn't tell the guys that he was coming on. So when he came on, some of the guys are looking like, man, you know, what is, you know they're frustrated, upset, and most of the guys at home. And uh, I just let him go. So before he got on, I just said, Chief, man, you do it how you need to do it. I'll, I'll sit back and I'll follow your lead. Um, it can get uncomfortable. But he was excited. But he said, Coach, uh, I'll say some things. They might get upset. Uh, I'm with them. I understand how they're feeling. But let's, let's get through this thing together. And, and I, I thought it was great. And that thing went probably about an hour and a half, which is a long time. Because I try to keep our guys no longer than 30 minutes. But, but I also go back to... Uh, why, why I felt like it was pertinent to have them, have them on because we, we do a Zoom call with my family on, on, on my side of the family. There's probably 25 or 30 of us on the Zoom call and my mom is on the call. And uh, so when that happened, that Sunday, uh, um, all, the, all the moms, everybody talking. So when it came my mom's turn, she said the word sorry, the word sorry cannot bring my son back. And and I think we, we have to take that into account. When, when that happens, all of a sudden, you make a quick decision. And I've always said now, you can ask my players. I've always promoted my players to, to try to get in law. I hate to say law enforcement, but, but to try to become police officers. Because I think no, there's no better uh, person that can be a police officer than someone that's been a part of sports. They understand camaraderie. They understand team. They understand leadership. They've been in situations. They understand people. That's all walks of life. But when my mom said that, because again, my, my brother spent 10 years in prison. Uh, so when my mom said that, it really hit me because we've never talked on that level. But when she said that as a mother, and I could, I could see her face when she's saying it, and my mother always tried to maintain her, her emotions uh, when we're around, but I, I can see it. And I just kind of looked away, you know, because it's, I, I've, I've never really seen her get emotional at the level. And, and you sit there now, look at my sons, it's like, my sons doesn't understand the world that I grew up in. I mean, just, just every day. And, and not that it was violence all over the place, but it just, for our guys, just be transparent. And I, I told our guys, man, if you feel like protesting, whatever it is you want to do, I'll follow your lead, man, because this is your stage. And I think for all of us, we have to understand one thing. When, when, and I tell people all the time, when, when they say that, that that was a peaceful protest, well, what, what does that mean? I mean, I, I just think it, then that was a gathering. I mean, so, so I think if there, there's no script to a protest. It, it, whatever happens, it happens. And I, you don't want chaos, but we have to understand you have to allow people to be free because if I didn't have to protest, then that means there wasn't an issue. I'm protesting because there's an issue. Right. Tyron, I wanted to ask you about growing up uh, also in the South, in, in New Orleans, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a difficult situation. And I'm wondering um, how, how that shaped your views on, on race and and progress and and how uh, when you look back on that time of your life um what is what, what was it about that that what was it how did how did you get out of that and and, and what inspired you yeah well I, I said first and foremost um you know my whole life i've been blessed to, to to have really great people come into my life and you know really put their hand on my shoulder and try their best to to really guide me um you know um I think growing up in the South, you know, uh, we were scared of the police, you know. Um, uh, we didn't necessarily think that those people were there to help us, you know. Um, and um, I think the best thing that, that really happened for me or that could have happened for me, you know, I was able to, um, I was able to go to a historically black, all black private school. 
uh, Catholic school uh, in St. Augustine. And, you know, um, you know, that place taught me <laughs> how to be proud of who I am as, as a black man. Uh, it also showed me, you know, what I was up against and, and how hard it would be to, you know, escape our environment and, and to, you know, provide a better life for the, for the people around us. And, um, you know, I always think back to that and I'm so grateful for that. And I, and I really wish everybody could, to have that experience, to 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 um to 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 know who they are, to to know where they come from, to to, to understand their people and, and also other people as well. And I thought I thought that school did that for me. You know, obviously aside from God um, and, and religion, it, it teaches you grace. Um, you know, for others, it teaches you how to serve others. And and I wish I wish everybody had that opportunity. You know, um, that, that I had, but uh, I think growing up in the South, um, you know, it was it was extremely difficult. Um, you know, uh, I think the environments that 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 we're in, um, that, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's hard. You know, I think the opportunities, the resources we have, you know, in, in urban America, um, is limited. You know, and um, it, either it's sports, or you know, maybe you're an entertainer, or you know, maybe you're maybe you're one of the smartest guys to be able to go to a great school and but it's just few of us and I feel like it can be so much more. And, um, you know, so, uh, that's why I want to get out in front of this thing. Um, I feel like, you know, the school I came from, uh, the place I came from in New Orleans, Louisiana has really prepared me to, to be able to accept who I am as a person, but also, um, show grace to others, right. And, and to try to help others, you know, um, you know, see it how I see it and, and me being able to, to see it, how they see it. And, you know, hopefully we could, be better for each other uh, all the way around. Hey, uh, Bill, I, I, you, just to refer to something you said earlier, you as uh, what you do and, and where you do it, you have an opportunity to be a, a leader in the community. And I'm just wondering, what what can that look like? Uh, what what kind of uh, tangible results could you could you see by um, by 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 being that that person taking a, an active role in the community, and the reason I bring this up is I I was on an NABC webinar a couple of weeks ago, and I heard Kelvin Sampson and John Calipari and and uh, several other coaches speak to this issue, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And one of the one of the suggestions was it was opportunity, not just for coaches, but maybe at that second level of you know assistant athletic director, trainer, sports information. You don't see many blacks in in those roles, and and uh, perhaps there's an opportunity there to to scout that and to and, and to help create those opportunities. Well, I, I think that you know you, you touched on a lot of things right there, and Conzo knows that. I mean, we 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 uh, we certainly have a, a, a sincere shortage uh, of. Uh, minorities, primary blacks having the same opportunities that whites do in, in, in the sports that, that uh, uh, provide our uh, living livelihood, entertainment. To, uh, and, and those, there's some things that I believe that can be done to improve those uh, and provide more opportunities without question. Uh, of course, that, that get, you, you go deep into, you know, just one thing, just to touch on that, we, we've got to have more opportunities for young people to get involved in our profession. If, if college basketball is primarily made up of, 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 uh, of uh, black kids at, at a high level, you know, and that, that go on and want to play professional sports, basketball, whatever, and then they want to get into coaching, there's not opportunities for those guys to get into coaching now. Uh, uh, so, so we've got to do some things, I think, through legislation that can help promote certain things like that. And, and certainly it can at the highest administrative level as well. Uh, I, I think that some of the things that, that, you know, we can do on campus, I, I, I think that coaches need to have a voice. I think uh, uh, all coaches need to have a voice. This is not a, 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 in my eyes, this is not a black thing. It's not a white thing. This is a we thing. And, and we all need to, to, to have a voice to, to express the value and the importance of, of uh, 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 equity uh, uh, amongst each other and the respect that we should have for each other. And certainly I feel like as the basketball coach at Kansas, I have an opportunity to probably have a stronger voice in that in our community as may, maybe anybody does, just like all you guys do in your, in your fields. And, and, and the thing about it is kids today are so much smarter than kids were myself and others that I hung with 
back in the day. They're, they're so much more educated. They're, 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 they're the opportunity to learn, uh, access to information. You may bring this up later, but hey, I grew up in Oklahoma. We didn't study the race riot, in, Tulsa race riot in 1921 in Oklahoma history, at least that I remember. And, and, and to think that the access that we have now to, to, to put our, our players and, and, and other students on a platform to be heard where it's done in such a, such a way that, that it draws us closer together, I, I think that coaches can help spearhead all that. I think we need to encourage all of our players to understand there is absolutely zero consequences, negative, for you to have the stand or for you to feel how you feel. It's okay to feel how you feel and to present that in a way. Uh, and, and kids have confidence to do so. So I think, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. I, th I think there's so many things uh, uh, in athletics. I, I know there's been so much talk, Kyran, about, about football and opportunities for head coaches. I believe there's four, if I'm not mistaken, the National Football League minorities. Uh, 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 and, and, of course, I'm not an expert and not going to go into that, but how can that be? And how can that be in college basketball as well? There, there, there's things that, that, that need to happen uh, uh, that certainly would, would, would help change in some scale just how everything is viewed. And certainly I think we, we all play a role in helping to develop that. Hey, Dayton, you, you give so many kids opportunities at the, uh, at the academy. And it's not just for – it's the Urban Youth Academy, but it's not just for urban kids. I, I know that you have been uh, – you know, it's your desire to have kids from – you know, from the, you know, from, from, the, from the suburbs, from rural areas, all uh, participate in, uh, you know, in, in baseball and softball at the, at the Urban Youth Academy. What's, what do you see as the great value of that? Well, I mean, that's, that's the mission of the UIA. I mean, we, we want to bring the, the urban and the suburban and the rural parts of our community together through the game of baseball and softball and, and get these kids growing up together and playing together and, and competing with each other for one another. And so, you know, that's been the vision from the very beginning, but we, we've learned so much in that journey, Blair. I mean, when we, when we began to, to talk about this in the community, uh, we began to break down barriers and we learned right away that there's a lot of hurts and um, the, the community wasn't real thrilled, some parts of the community about having kids from the suburbs, white kids from the suburbs, uh, playing uh, in uh, the 18th and binary, didn't want them in the area. And so when we would begin to discuss that, um, we would have conversations that were similar to this. And we would say, look, we're so sorry you feel the way you do. And uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to listen and we're, we're going we're gonna to commit to do better. And so, but how do we as a group make sure that your children and your grandchildren and my children and grandchildren don't grow up and feel the same way that you feel. What can we do different? How can we utilize the Urban Youth Academy uh, to make sure that we do better in the future? And so, you know, that's, that's really the mission of what we do. And then to be able to have it right next to the Negro Leagues Museum, to have uh, a civic treasure like the Negro Leagues Museum right there in our, in our own backyard where the UIA is and, and somebody like Bob Kendrick who tells the story so well and uh, is able to unite people and bring people together through the stories of the Negro Leagues. I mean, so it's just a perfect fit to do all that and to accomplish all that. But to piggyback on what Bill said, you know, Major League Baseball, we have done a very poor job and it's hurtful because it's been a directive that we've been given for the last 27 years since I've been in professional baseball. And as we sat uh, at the, the GM meetings last November, I sat next to Kenny Williams, who's an African-American gentleman, president of the Chicago White Sox. I said to Kenny, I said, Kenny, look around this room. I said, you're seeing the same thing I see. And I said, Kenny, I've got to ask you this. How does this make you feel? And Kenny's, yeah. Kenny's hurt, and we're all hurt because of it. We, we've got to do better. And so we've got to create succession plans. The only reason any of us get to sit here on this panel is because we had mentors in our life come alongside of us and help us navigate through things, shape us and mold us. And so we have to be able to do that. We've got to reach down and shape and mold young players and young people 
to be executives, to be coaches, to be instructors, to be journalists, to be trainers, whatever the case may be. And so we've got a responsibility to do that. And, um, you know, we, we've got to put all of our, our energies into that, into the next generation. And, and, I, and I told our group the other day, I, I'm, ser- I'm not concerned about winning one more baseball game. I'm concerned about getting this right going forward. Our legacy in Kansas City needs to be what have we done to include others and to give opportunities for others who have been disadvantaged. And the last thing I'll say, I was raised as a coach and I was always told that the cream will rise to the top. The cream will always rise to the top. But in leadership, I've learned that's not always the case. There are people in our communities and in our country that start on second base and third base, and they act like they hit the double or the triple. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with what type of family you were born into, what your color of skin is, and there's many who have been disadvantaged, and we have to do a better job of mentoring, speaking up, and providing a way for others to succeed so they have hope. Christiana, I see you nodding your head to, to a lot of this. I just want to ask you as someone who's a, you know, a college student on, on the panel, the only college student um, in your life, the way your life has uh, been shaped and uh, the, the, the leadership, the mentorship that, that you had, did, did you, uh, do, did you, have you, do you find that there, there needs to be more, uh, more people of color in those positions? And I think I saw a stat the other day that there are more white women's bat, white male women's basketball coaches and there are black female women's basketball coaches at the at the college level yeah definitely i mean to kind of go off of i mean i definitely agree with a lot of the things coach self was saying about um having coaches stand behind their players i mean to be able to have a coach that understands that not every time players need to stand behind them and in situations like this coaches are willing to stand behind their players and and follow their lead i think that's a big thing Um, I mean, most definitely, I do feel like there are a lot of still firsts for African Americans to be in in high positions. And I feel like, you know, as a 20 year old female athlete, I do think that that is crazy to me. Um, You know, growing up with both my parents, my mom is white, my dad is black. um, I've heard a lot of I've had the talks with my dad about the typical what do you do when you get pulled over? But then from my mom's side of it, she doesn't necessarily understand. And so I've gotten both of those sides where I've had to get educated. And then I've also had to educate my mom. Mm-hmm. And we've had a lot of run-ins um, with that over um, the last couple of years, just me growing into the woman that I am. And I feel like this situation has definitely opened her eyes a lot. And um, she's taken the position to, you know, follow my lead with this and support me with this. And so to have a coach be able to do that um, is definitely nice. I mean, to be able to have people of African Americans in those positions, it does help. Um, It does help have connections, me being an African American woman. It does help to have somebody on the staff that I can go to about those problems. But, you know, with that, I do feel like people need to have those hard conversations. Like someone said earlier, we need to be able to educate people. So not only African-Americans understand, but we get on a level where everybody understands. And I think that is the most important thing where we get to a position where everybody understands injustice. And not only when people say, I don't see color, I want you to be able to see my color and I want you to be able to accept it. And I want you to be able to learn, educate yourself and learn why I am the way that I am and why I have to move the way that I do and do what I do um, from all walks of life. Because just as much as I feel like people need to educate on African Americans. I need to educate on, you know, I've done a lot of research with why people are so closed minded on this topic. And I've had to educate myself on, okay, how, how can I better educate them to understand where I'm coming from? And when you're coming from a place of anger and a place of hurt, it's hard to speak up on this topic simply because you're trying not to come at them as this is how I feel. I'm angry. I'm mad. And you need to feel this because they're not going to feel it. They're not going to understand unless they're put in that position. And so I feel like moving forward, if you come with a more of an educational approach, um, I feel like people are going to listen a lot more. Right. Hey, so I was going to, I was going to end our discussion today with a, with another group question. And the question was going to be, 
what would progress look like? How, how will we know when progress has been made? What are the clues? What are the hints? What are the obvious um, indicators that progress has been made? And maybe we'll, we'll try to do this quickly um, because I know we're, we're up against time here, but Bob, how, do you have a thought on that? Well, honestly, Blair, I, I think progress is in progress. You know, progress begins when we are open and honest with one another. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we believe that if we don't talk about these things, then it must not be happening. And we know that's not true. And, and so to be able to engage in this manner, to bring a multiplicity of people to the table to address these kinds of issues, that's a sign of progress. And, you know, I always reflect, and, I, and maybe that's because of the environment that I work in, uh, Dayton is just so easy for me to reflect on everything that I learned from our friend Buck O'Neill and uh, the realization that in this world we have more good people than we do bad people. So often times the good people have said idle though and, and watch bad things happen to others and not been engaged and involved. I think we're seeing a, a polar shift in that this time around and, and I think that's why I have such great hope and optimism that people like Christiana and others will help lead this necessary change, but also to have leaders in our community like Coach Self and Coach Martin and, and Dayton, uh, because you have a heart for this. This means something to each and every one of us that we have an opportunity to leave this place better than the way we found it. And, 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 and so that's, I think, really why I believe that this is part of the progress. And, and I do think we'll see the systemic change that we all hope to from a legislative standpoint. And if we change some people's hearts along the way, man, more power to us. You know, we hope that we do. But we certainly want to change the things that allow people to abuse the system and keep other people oppressed. And, and I think we're all committed to doing that. And maybe just along the way, we might change some hearts too. Well, I, th I think that's a fantastic final thought. And um, look, so in closing, I just want to thank each of our panelists for participating in this event and also give a shout out to our production person, Beth Welsh, executive sports editor, Jeff Rosen, and columnist, Vahe Gregorian, for all the work they put into this. And thank all of you for joining us on Facebook Live. And panelists, I, um, uh, it was terrific. Thanks for doing this. And, uh, and hopefully, We'll see progress made. Thanks, Blake. Thank you. Guys. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck to everybody. Okay, you too. Thank you. That'll do it for today and this week on Sports BKC. Thanks, as always, to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Savannah Smith, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett. The tip of the cap to Vahe Gregorian, who did tremendous work in helping put together the panel for the Race and Sports Forum. Hey, Vahe's got a terrific column on the friendship between former Chiefs Abner Hayes and Chris Burford that's on the website right now, kansascity.com. Please read that. Hey, earlier in the episode, you heard me talk about the Sports Pass offer. It still stands and still a good one. 30 bucks for a year's worth of sports coverage, and that includes the Sports Extra on the E-Edition. There's 22 additional pages of national sports coverage today. Here's an even better offer. Buy the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news, features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage. The details can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. That's account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Monday with another episode.